emotion blocking so I'm having a chance to process everything that's going on and things that I'm hearing over the last three months I would say um, some of the language over social media in the press um, has caused a lot of concern for me um, and I think I'm on this journey where I'm I'm processing a lot of things and experiences that I didn't necessarily find offensive in the past and speaking to past friends and colleagues and having people say to me their first experience of racism they ever witnessed was towards me. Um, it's, it's, it's a pr pretty big thing and we've been talking it out and, and just really reflecting in on myself um, and, and just everything that's going on. It's a lot out going on out there um, and it can, it can get potentially really overwhelming. So what I'm trying to do is just focus my energies onto positive paths. It's, um, it's pretty uncomfortable, some of the conversations, but I, I have to believe there's positive outcomes and actions that can come from what I'm doing. Amazing. And Josh, how have you been doing recently as well? I think I'm just shocked at what's been going on. It's a lot to take in a couple of months. So I think that uh, there's been, there's been, this issue has been around for a long time, but it's been now that we're having a conversation that needs to be had. And I think for me, I've been really pivotal in actually talking to people and just actually having the conversation that needs to have to actually edu educate people. Because, you know, I went for a long time, I didn't speak about it because I thought um, it'd be conflictual, but it's now, there's no stopping me. I'm out there raising awareness, speaking to people, say, you know, um, what are you, have you had these conversations? What are you doing to try and raise awareness on sort of like um, how sort of like people are treated and stuff? Because again, it's one of the things that kind of got put to the back. And then now it's more important more than ever that we kind of push it forward to actually have the conversation, spread the word and actually raise awareness. But it's been, it's been hard. It has been hard. I must be honest in there. But Thankfully, the friends I've got are actually the ones that have really helped me through it, actually be able to talk about these things and actually had them open, uncomfortable conversations. Amazing. Well, again, thank you so much for both being here, guys. Um, as I said, and for those of you who have just joined, please engage as much as possible in the chat box. You know, this is a really open conversation. It needs to be as raw as possible. It's, we're going to get very emotional. <laughs> Um, and this is just really important that we all collaborate and we all, you know, discuss this as much as possible. And right now it's a perfect opportunity to do so. Um, so let's open up and get real about this situation because everybody is here today to learn about how we can support and raise the profile of our black colleagues. So let's talk about why that's important. Um, so Hayley, let's start with you. What have your personal experiences been, both inside and outside the workplace, where you've been overlooked by the non-white community? So I think one of the things that I want to make really clear from, from, from the off, this is not a black v white issue. This is everyone against racism um, and discrimination. Um, and sometimes when you see things in the media, they can just pick up on sound bites and run with it in the wrong direction. For me, um, in, in the workplace, once I'm in a workplace, I think I've been very fortunate um, and I've had quite positive experiences. I think where I have got a bit stuck is in the recruitment process um, um, and visiting recruiters um, because you have to go in, you meet them, they want to see who you are, they want to usually test you. And previously, I've people have just been shocked that I've turned up for the job or I've turned up to sign up. Um, my maiden name could have could be from anywhere. And I think people used to make assumptions that I was from a certain place um, and not of and not black. Um, and <laughs> some people have just jumped out their skin when they've seen me um, sitting there and they've called my name and I've gone oh hi um, which led me to only use two companies in, throughout my whole career because 
they made me feel comfortable. They made me feel well. They just made me feel like me. And I walked in there and it was just a total non-issue. So for me, it would, my experiences, my not so great experiences have been from the recruitment process, not when I'm situated in a company. Um, and I know that that's not necessarily the case for all. Um, and I'm very fortunate to have had those experiences. I think um, for me, I've had, I agree with Hayley, I've had the same thing with recruiters when they've looked at me. And it's kind of been, the what is like the way you get looked up and down and think, oh. oh. And for me, it's just, um, it's been hard, but I think I've learned that my sort of skill set speaks for itself and actually, you know, I could do the job just as much as anyone else can, actually to be given that much as an opportunity. And actually, luckily in some ways, I can be quite confident, at, you know, putting that across, if that makes sense. Um, but I do think that it's a lot harder for me, to, um, well, I found to actually get to the, you know, the front and um, actually secure that position sometimes. Yeah. No, I think there's, I mean, that's a recurring topic that came up throughout those conversations that we had, wasn't it? It was about, you know, diversity and inclusion needs to start at the very beginning where you're going through that hiring process and you're being represented by recruiters and they need to be able to do that properly and fairly and also encourage not just diverse um, shortlists, but also, you know, educate their clients better on what they should be doing in comparison to what they currently do. And there are so many areas which need to be improved when it comes to that recruiter client relationship for anything to change, because it's a, it, it's almost like you're losing before you even try and start, which it's is like you have these stereotypes um, and back <laughs> Back when I started, I'm 40 years old, so back when I started, it was very much, you had to be degree educated. Um, sometimes it was very home county, the very home counties look in the UK. Um, so when I used to turn up, they just, quite frankly, they just didn't know what to do with me. But once I found that once I engaged in conversation, and this, <laughs> this sounds terrible, once I engaged in conversation, then they were quite happy to put me in front of their clients. But it was like I had to get past their, their stereotyping. Yeah, and um, Dorothy's just put a really um, good comment. And chat box is going brilliantly, by the way, everybody. So thank you so much. But Dorothy has put, yes, has anyone else walked in for an interview and looked around and seen there wasn't diversity there and knew you wouldn't get the job no matter how well the interview went? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely crazy. No. Ridiculous. Um, okay, well, look, let's talk about diversity and inclusion. Um, campaigns, initiatives, programs that are being um, or that already exist at work or perhaps are just starting to be reintroduced or there's more attention paid to them. So um, to make a diversity and inclusion campaign successful or a program or initiative, what do employers and what do employees need to expect from those diversity and inclusion programs? Josh, let's start with you. So you've got to have someone who's passionate about what they're delivering because if they're not passionate then the, the wrong message is going to come across and I think for me um, it's about having people that actually like a team that know what they're doing, know the right subjects to talk about and actually pushing that forward and actually making sure the topics are fit for purpose rather than it just being you know for example like a session that's not even relevant because it's not like sitting for a session where it's not even relevant to anything that's being of the topic. And I need to be aware of kind of probably like I'd say history and then look at how things can move forward and look at what's happened before and how they can use that to move forward and actually um, make sure that any sort of network they're putting together actually has all the right components to make it successful. I think I, I echo what Josh says and I think with anything it starts with a with a conversation, a two-way conversation, um, and you both have to be prepared to listen, um, be uncomfortable, um, share. You may not, depending on how far into the, the process you are, you, your, your sharing element may go up. Um, 
hopefully it would go up. Um, and then it's just feeling, for me personally, it's feeling safe and feeling comfortable and that you're in a space where you can, you can be yourself. Uh, you're, it's authentic. Um, it's from the heart. We, we, we all work in businesses. We all have objectives um, and we all have deliverables. But it, it's the human element for me, which is really, really important. And you, you need to belong where you are and understanding your people is a huge step in achieving that. Yeah, and it has to be community led, doesn't it? It can't be just, just done by the board. Mm. It can't just be done by the execs. It has to be from top to bottom for there to be any, any way of achieving a true diversity and inclusion program that does represent everybody, especially because the majority of boards are still white men. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, guys, we, we decided when we were prepping for this that we wanted to make this again as interactive as possible. So we have got a couple of polls that we want to put to you all as we go through this whole conversation. Um, so our first poll is, do you have a diversity and inclusion program at work? And do you think it's effective? So either yes, you have a DNI program and you do think it's effective. Yes, we have a DNI program and I don't think it's effective or no, you don't have a DNI program at all. And even if you are unsure, if you don't 100% know if there is a program, um, that in my opinion means that the company hasn't, you know, given you that opportunity to actually know that there is something that they're doing to, you know, make everyone feel that they're receiving equal opportunities. So we'll let that run um just for a moment but as i said the chat box is going absolutely brilliantly thank you to everybody who is getting involved um lorraine atherton has put one of my previous employees was really good in terms of interview panels it was always three people one male one female and someone who was from a minority background but she's never seen that anywhere else that she's worked wow i mean in my opinion that should just be you know the status quo that should be something that is but it also leads into the fact that yes you may want to put these panels together but do you actually have do you have people of of mm. those ethnicities working in your firm to actually form those panels yeah yeah i've actually only ever had one interview where it's been mixed there's been otherwise it hasn't and that's quite scary to think that there's been a panel where it's very diverse mm. Tracy's also put, um, hi Tracy, I, I miss you Tracy. <laughs> um, she, Tracy's also put that she agrees, but she also thinks it's directed to older people or heavier people. A judgment is more often than not made before they even know what your skills are. Um, yeah, I think that's mm. a key theme that we've all spoken about throughout this conversation so far, isn't it, as well? You're kind of judged before you're even listened to. Um, but yeah, interesting. Okay, so let's have a look at these results. So 25 or 30 of you have um, contributed. So thank you very, very much. Um, we, yes, we have a DNI program and I do think it's effective. 11 of you have agreed. Yes, we have a DNI program. I don't think it's effective. Nine of you have agreed with that. And five of you have said that you don't have a DNI program at all. Wow. Interesting. It is, and it's just, it's like, where do you go? Can, you need to be able to have somewhere that you can land with, with kind of anything and to, to get a steer on these sensitive topics. So not actually knowing if you, if you have one is, or where to, where to contact it, that, that, that sends alarm bells ringing for me a little bit. Yeah. It's very scary that there's not even anything like on an internet where you can find them resources because, you know, it's just, it's needed. It doesn't even have to be big and flashy. It just, if it's like you're a 10 person firm, um, mm. it's just everyone can be coming together and it, it being on the agenda and it being brought up and addressed and just making sure that there's airtime for it. Could I just mention that my current workplace actually had it in their induction when it had actually in, um, sort of like an equality and diversity workshop as part of the mandatory induction on the programme. So 
for me, that it just says volumes about a company and actually where they're going with things. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thanks, guys. Um, keep the questions coming, everybody. You know, Hayley and Josh are here to answer absolutely anything that you've got. And we, we all agreed before this conversation even started that, um, you know, there's there's nothing that you could say that's wrong, that's that's too strange, too weird, anything that, you know, you feel, anything that is relevant to you right now. This is, as I said, your opportunity for to use this platform to kind of voice those opinions and those thoughts and have a really open conversation about it, which is so important. Um, so let's move on. So, you know, we've obviously chatted about this before and racism Manifest, manifests itself in many, many forms. And there's been a huge focus recently on understanding microaggressions um, and the negative impact that they have. And obviously for a lot of people, pe people still don't understand what microaggressions are. They still don't recognize what they are. Um, and they come up every single day and people don't even realize that what they're doing is obviously wrong and the things that they're saying is wrong. Um, and something that we all agreed was that language feeds into almost every single type of microaggression. So how can the non-white community um, become more, oh sorry, the, 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 the non-black community become more aware and adjust their language to ensure that microaggressions are you know, eliminated or banished from conversation as much as possible? So, like, my understanding of a microaggression, it, it's, it's a verbal statement or action. Um, it's, it can be subtle, it can be overt, it can, it can be unintentional or direct, but regardless, it's still discrimination and it's still a microaggression. And for me, it's, a, it's education and it's understanding what, what, how that's made up. Um, and when someone does call out one or highlight something to you, it's also not automatically getting on the defensive. It's just, now's the time. Let, let's talk it out. Kind of, why did you say that? Um, do you know what I mean? What was your intent behind it? Um, and it's empowering people to and I, I've experienced microaggressions myself um, early on in my career and I would say it was around kind of tick, the tick in the boxes oh my goodness do you know what I mean yeah you're 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 a woman and you're black do you know what I mean they've ticked a few diversity boxes with me and I didn't feel at the time kind of comfortable enough to say well actually th this is really wrong so I just shrugged it off but if I was to hear that now uh, my response would be completely different it's it's like it's like back in back I would say 20 odd years ago it was kind of acceptable to be able to say things like that and get away with it um it's not acceptable now um also it's it's having the conversation again. I keep on going back to this. If, if you don't talk to someone, you can't understand them. Even if you don't agree what they, with what they're saying, it's just having an understanding of someone's perspective and not everyone's going to agree with you or people might have different ideas. Um, it's just kind of understanding all of that. And it's not okay to say some things. I think terminology plays a big part in... Um, what someone says actually can damage somebody as a person and actually, you know, that label can um, stick with that. And unfortunately, it's kind of, we've got into this kind of habit where we can throw away all these like sort of insults, not really what the actual word actually means. And then it's almost like, oh, I apologise later. When really, it's so, when something's said, sometimes it's hard to take back, if that makes sense. And I think as... Um, I think as well, it's just kind of stamping out things that, um, terminologies that are actually quite old fashioned that actually shouldn't be used nowadays. Um, I, I, I also think like, if you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say it. It's, it can be as yeah. basic as that. That's um, just obvious, surely. <laughs> yeah, but it's but not what? to some people. Uh, no. like, what I've seen over the past couple of months on social media um, has really disarmed me um, and seeing some comments and um, I've 
I've unfriended a few people. Um, I've unfollowed a few things. Um, I, I, I can't give, I can't give airtime to that. It's not positive energy. And if I've had the opportunity to say, well, actually, you know, you're wrong. You've, you've, you've posted something or you've said something with no context whatsoever. Rather, it's that you are in a privileged position just firing out all of this stuff. Um, and that touches upon white privilege. Um, me and my sister have, have had a really in-depth discussion in regards to light privilege. Um, we're mixed race. Um, my mother was English. My father is Ghanaian. Um, and kind of what that has meant for us over the years and how that's opened up certain opportunities for us, um, which is just a whole other conversation. Um, but it's, it's, it's the tiny comments that chip away at you and can kind of gnaw in the back of your head and crush people's confidence and it, it's it's soul destroying it really is and if you have the opportunity st stand up for your friends your colleagues your family it's it's not okay and this is the time we have books internet we have all of these resources at our disposal um use them if you choose not to use them we know your stance yeah and um, so when um obviously there was a, a, a an extreme focus on black lives matter you know a couple of months ago when um you know the george floyd tragedy happened um i wiped our content schedule for an entire week and we just populated the website with anti-racism resources um links to black owned businesses um wonderful amazing black strong women that you should be following on social media you know get rid of all of the the rubbish that you look at on social media and start looking at real people who are truly inspiring for what they stand for the things that they've achieved and not just you know people who are sponsored by brands to appear at the top of your news feed and that was so powerful there are so many people who reached out to us and said that they had no idea where to start when it came to educating themselves on anti-racism resources and it's obviously no one's responsibility to teach you not to be racist it's your responsibility yeah. um, so if anybody wants to have a look at those resources if you just go to the assistantroom.com they are all on the front page at the very very top of the website and they are going to stay there because we are going to make sure that there is a consistent message and theme throughout everything that we do from now on to promote as much diversity and inclusion in every single thing that we do and obviously this conversation today um, is a part of it so before we move on to actually no let's do our next poll because we have got one more poll and whilst that is go or taking place um, we've got a few really great comments and questions in the chat box from people um, that let's go through those um, at the minute so our next poll is going to be do you feel like your business is doing enough to promote um, the non-white community from top to bottom um, so Let's have a look through the chat box um, and let's go to, Lorraine had a fantastic comment. Julia, hi Julia. Julia's, you know, super active on here um, and she's providing lots and lots of input. So that's absolutely brilliant. Louise has said she, sorry, she's proud to work in an organization that takes this very seriously and is always open to, and keen to learn and do better. That's obviously fantastic. Um, Julia has asked, Josh, do you come across any racism? Uh, not racism, sorry, sexism as well. Not so much now. I think somewhere I worked before, I did actually experience it quite a lot because I was sort of the only guy in like the business support field. And I really got some really like, really derogatory comments. So I'm thinking, I'm doing a job just like you are. And uh, anyone can do, male or female. Yeah. And um, for me, it just really, at first it got to me and then I kind of then thought to myself, I'm not going to let it get to me because actually, as long as I'm happy in what I'm doing, that's all that matters. But I think when, I think it's just, it was mind, it was just my, a mind blown experience, but I don't get them now, not so much now, no. But before I used to get them quite a lot. I think because I'm quite confident in my ability and what I do, 
it doesn't it doesn't leave room for anyone to come and kind of have them comments now that's a really good outlook on things as well. Really good outlook. And Sarah, she, Sarah is one of our members. Hi, Sarah. Sarah has said that she, in our previous poll, selected um, no, but the company she works for are actually in the process of rolling out um, a diversity and inclusion program. It's in such early stages. Um, and she says she can't really say yes, that they have one at this stage, but they are implementing one, which is obviously fantastic. That's amazing. And and one of the things that I, I hold really dear is, is, is that you don't have to give the whole campaign away. You don't have to expect so much. Just being, being kept up to date with what's happening. Um, yes, we understand things need to be rolled out and things need to be work, worked on in the background. That's absolutely fine. Um, but you just, like, know, knowing it's happening, it's, it's, it's sometimes that's enough. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lorraine has also put, she totally agrees with everything you've been saying, Hayley. She's unfriended a lot of people on social media over their racist views. I think hopefully everybody has been unfriending a few people, to be honest, because I think that seems to be quite a common theme right now. Um, and she said, someone said to her, but you're white, so what does it matter to you? And she was really angry at that comment. And Lorraine, I've had similar experiences running the assistant room. We've had an extreme negative backlash on everything that we've been doing. And I won't go into too much detail, but I, I think the way that I described it to Hayley and Josh the other day was that I didn't realise how racist people were until we saw over... 1,000 people drop, up, drop off our newsletter list when we started, you know, promoting what we were doing to support Black Lives Matter um, and to promote our, our new campaign, um, Colleagues Unite. We've had loads and loads of comments from what could only be described as trolls saying that as an organisation, we mean well, but we're not coming across well. <laughs> um, and I think Hayley and I had a conversation earlier and I think this whole this whole circumstance and this topic, and, and obviously it's ongoing, but this has all been a, a really big, I think, uh, process of exposure for us to understand exactly who we want to align ourselves with going forward and what our values are and how important our values are to stand by. And if you haven't got people around you who you know, align with those values, there's no loss really to who you are or what you stand for if those people are no longer around you and I'm I'm pretty certain Hayley and Josh you you must feel exactly the same I'm I, I just feel I feel that I've I've seen a lot of friends and um comments there's I've I've had a lot of people who who've stayed kind of silent but when we do talk to them it's it's basically being scared to ask the wrong question and I think uh, we've got Louise in the chat box as well uh, there's no there's no right or wrong way to have this conversation it's going to get sticky it's going to get uncomfortable um, and there's an everyone floats into their comfort zone every now and again and it's kind of you need to have these conversations that kind of get you a bit hot under the collar and that they make you sweat and you're just like oh my goodness and I've, I've had to have a a good look at myself and how I do things and how I interpret things, which sometimes I think is okay, which is not. Um, there, there's a lot of fear of the unknown around this. Um, I think my only advice can be is uh, you just just have the conversation, ask the questions. It you, you won't kind of get anywhere by keeping silent um i i'm reading numerous books at the moment and i'm i'm, I'm taking a while to get through them because i feel like i need to make notes because i need to make notes on my own history there's things about both sides of my family i don't know and i'm learning um and it, it's scary i'm 40 i kind of thought i've had part of it figured out by now and it's not the case but I want to learn and I want to be able to challenge myself. Um, and it doesn't matter. Like just if you're black, if you're white, if from the BAME background, just have the conversation. It's, 
it's fine. It's okay. This is uncharted territory. Well, not uncharted, but this, this awareness and this feeling and the fact that I feel that change will come positive change and lasting impactful change. And that's what I'm hanging on to. And this is this, this, this you've got to talk about it. Yeah, I mean, Veronique has made a really, really good comment um, in response to Louise's point, which I think a lot of people feel, you know, or am I, gonna, you know, treading on eggshells? Am I going to say the wrong thing? And then it gets confused sometimes with people thinking, I'm just not going to say anything. But Veronique has put, you know, be uncomfortable. It's a human emotion we can all relate to. I think it, it's, it's just down to confidence, isn't it? If you feel like there's something wrong, just say it. You know, you would expect someone to you know, have your back if something was happening to you. Um, so it's just about uniting under this, um, well, under, under every cause that's for a positive reason and making sure that we all live by those, um, as I said, those values that we hold. And it doesn't matter who, who comes at you to try and destroy those values. You stick to them and you stand up for yourself and you stand up for the people around you. And as PAs and EAs, we're not just support, you know, support to the people we work for, but we're also a support to each other. We are. Um, and I think that this is, this is another thing. We are some of my biggest supporters. Um, my biggest confidence are my peers. Um, I've been at my current company for the last 12 years some of these people are, are practically like my family, are my family. Um, and they're my first port of call as well. Um, and for me, I hold that very dear. Um, and having a, a support group, because that's what it is, if you want to put a label on it, having a support group like that is, they, they have been on some of the highs of my life, the lows of my life. Um, and I, I, I trust, for them to question me and challenge me and it's okay to be challenged. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, look, let's have a look at these. Um, let's have a look at these polling answers um, because everybody got involved this time, which is absolutely brilliant. So do you feel like your business is doing enough to promote the non-white community from top to bottom? Um, we had a 70% response of no and a 30% wow of yes and i think that says absolutely everything that we that need speaks to volumes have. yeah and and it's obviously the reason we're having this conversation right and as you said Hayley, it's about the conversation we need to be talking about this we need to be using the platforms like with the assistant room this is a platform that we can use to have a good conversation to start creating more and more awareness about the reality of this problem and what you guys can you know advise everybody here considering that answer is such a strong no about how we can start changing it so yeah I mean everybody seems to be shocked at 70% I'm shocked at 70% I didn't think it was that's quite high that's very high yeah really really high but um it's a good thing that we're obviously, you know, involving everybody in these conversations because then it does become a much more open conversation and a topic um, for us to really start building upon as well. So, um, guys, what I'd like to just say, because we are going to move on to our final question, um, if anybody has any full questions that they want to put to Hayley and Josh at the end of this session, please now use the Q&A box. Um, the chat box has absolutely been fantastic. We've had a really, really great community feel throughout this entire session. But if there are any particular questions that you've got and you can ask them anonymously in the Q&A box and um, please submit them now. So whilst that takes place, whilst everybody's kind of doing their bits and bobs, guessing themselves together for their final question uh, or, or their questions, let's move on to um, question five of our session and Josh let's start with you so how exactly do we start enacting change in the workplace you know considering that 70% response um, of the businesses people feeling like their business isn't supporting the non-white community from top to bottom what can we start doing to enact change to raise and support the profiles of our black colleagues we need to have these conversations just have conversations have workshops have some sort of event whereby 
there's a panel where like there's a group where people come together and they start talking because unless people talk there's not going to be change and change needs to happen it needs to happen now it can't happen in 10 years time because you know enough's happened um and i think as well it's just really breaking down if someone's going to put um like a campaign or something together let you looking at what they're doing why they're doing it and doing it for the right reasons because anyone can put a campaign together but no it doesn't need to be done for show it needs to be um it needs to be honest and which which really i've seen a lot of stuff happen, like over the last couple of weeks and i feel like some stuff isn't quite and i think it's just for show and for me that really dismantles why we're doing what we're doing yeah, I totally agree. I think the reason why at the assistant room we really focused on this is because we felt as though there was nobody in the admin industry really doing anything to show visibility on this or to represent the global industry. And it just, that that can't, you know, I have a response, not just a responsibility, but I want to be able to obviously empower everybody in our network, not just people who are white you know it doesn't work like that we're a global industry we all have you know different jobs for different ages we come from you know we've got different backgrounds we have different experiences in life and it, we can't cater to just one person because that isn't real life no it's not it's not at all um i i think with that how can you get involved um Again, have the conversation. That will be my sound bites of the evening. Um, if you don't have anything in your company, just start talking to people. Uh, us as PAs and EAs, we're the human touch point for our businesses. We, we, we kind of embody um, inclusion because we, we, we need to be, well, in my opinion, is that we need to be that way to be able to service our businesses. Um, and you need, it needs to be everyone included. It can't be, well, we're only going to take four people from here. No, have a conversation. Break it down into groups. Break it down into subgroups. I've found that, that that's worked really, really well. Um, people may be more passionate about one area than another. Really, truly understand what, in, what inclusion means. And it, it's a safe space for everyone to, to meet and to be able to share their ideas and make progress in what's needed for your firm's people. Yeah, brilliant. And obviously as PAs and EAs, everybody is in a really amazing position where you can actually guide the agenda of your exec and you are actually in, in a place where you probably have more of an effect on what can happen within the company than as opposed to lots of other people within the business. I, I also think don't, un, don't underestimate your, your impact. Um, don't underestimate yourselves. Um, you, can make, you can make a change for one person and then that can inspire them and give them the confidence. And it doesn't mean that they're, they're a peer. It, they can be a peer. They can be a higher level. Um, it, 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 titles don't make, kind of make a difference on that level. It's when we're talking about the human element of things, we're all human first before we have a job title. Yeah, do you know, Bev has made a really, really good point and thank you for raising this, Bev. Um, it's sort of a bit of a deadline that I suppose everybody here can really commit to. Um, Black History Month is in October. Um, so really, you know, if there isn't something right now that you're currently doing or your business is doing, you've got plenty of time to put something in place and to see it through to fruition in time for Black History Month, because that's what, a month and a half away? Um, that is a, a long time to be able to start having those conversations and to get people engaged. So thank you, Bev, for that, because that's a really, really good point. And as I said, that kind of gives us all a bit of a deadline that we can all work to. Um, 
There's so much positivity on this call. I'm absolutely loving it. Simone has put, there seems to be a fear around discussing race that is not apparent when discussing other differences. It feels as if you actively support one thing, others feel that you reject everything else. Having an inclusivity or an inclusive society benefits everyone, no matter if it's about gender, race, ability, social mobility. Um, and Simone, that is pretty much exactly why we've created this Colleagues Unite campaign, because we're going to be talking about anyone, as I said earlier, who is underrepresented. So we're not just going to be talking about the black community, we're going to be talking about people with invisible illnesses, we're going to be talking about the LGBTQ plus community, because there's just so much power and strength within so many people that is completely overlooked all the time and it is just a huge 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 mistake by businesses to not represent everybody fairly and equally it just i mean i think tracy mentioned it earlier it just absolutely blows her mind that this sort of behavior still still exists and i think everybody who you know well i think everybody on this call would definitely you know agree with that um yeah sarah has said in response to bev's um, point the Black History Month that is a really good point so she's going to suggest that to her boss tomorrow. There's some fantastic Amazing. resources out there. Um, Jess, I, I, can, I can send you a few and maybe you can share. Um, uh, there's some amazing um, videos on YouTube, um, which, do you know what? As I said, it doesn't have to be big, all guns are blazing. It could be a round of coffees and an educational video. Um, it, it can be as simple as that. And it, it's just do something. It's just, yeah. and it's just learning about who you are and how much you want to contribute or how much you don't feel you can contribute and n getting to know yourself through the process as well. Yeah. Everybody has a part to play in this. Absolutely. And it's, Absolutely. it's, Everyone has a part. If you have a heart, you have a part. Yeah, awesome. Well, look, let's move on to our Q&A. Thank you so much, by the way, both of you. It's been such a wonderful, wonderful experience listening to you both and, and you know, just hearing about your experiences and, and really understanding how everybody can just make that first step because it's about making that first step that creates all of the opportunity going forward, doesn't it? So um, it's just about actually going for it and um, yeah. doing so unapologetically because you know it's the right thing to do. Um, but we've got um, a couple of questions here. So question one, I work in financial services and more times than I can count, I've had someone say to me, oh, I thought you were white. I've been the token brown face for so long. Early on, I really felt like an imposter. Are there any tools that you use that would help to combat feeling like a token slash imposter? Um, she, this, um, this person works currently for a small hedge fund and they have no DNI program or initiative. I've been there um, and I've 100% had imposter syndrome. Oh, sorry, I think I've just lost my link. Yeah, I've 100% had Im imposter syndrome. Um, do I belong here? Is this my world? Am I going to get an invite to this event? Does my face fit? Um, I kind of, and as I said, this was, this is like eight, 18, over 18, uh, 18 -ish years ago. Um, and I just, again, it goes down to support network. I, my, my parents were fantastic. We always spoke things through. And if I was feeling weird about some, something, I could go there. And they told me to show up do everything that I want to do, do more, do my job to the best of my ability um, and don't take any BS from anybody. So I kind of did that. And sometimes I'd hear things and just let it ride over my head. And then sometimes I would kind of talk to a friend about it. Um, but I kind of, I didn't want it to prevent me. But obviously, when you're going through that, I'm, I'm years down the line, when you're going through that, it, it can be like, do I want to be here? Do I, want to, do I want to get up for work every day? So, you know, reach out, message me on LinkedIn. I, I, and I've worked in a tiny little finance company before, and it, it can get quite awkward. Um, but maybe you opening a conversation um, might help. Um, it might 
you shouldn't necessarily be the one to have to instigate it. But if people know that you're open for conversation, it might, it might flow a bit more easily. Uh, if not, then maybe you've got a clearer picture of as to the type of people that you work for. Brilliant. And Josh, how do you feel about that in terms of, are there any tools that you use that would help, you know, this person in particular combat feeling like an imposter? I think it's, it's kind of just how, I think it's having the conversation actually just um, kind of speak it up on things. Um, uh, it's a hard one because I think, I'm trying to think, how do I put it? I think just, it's almost like if you kind of have to, like have them conversations, then it kind of helps you to kind of overcome it to an extent. Does that, I hope that makes sense. Speaking it out loud. Yeah. Um, like <laughs> affirmate, like, yeah, kind of. An yeah. affirmation. I, I'm like, yeah. I'm great. Would you like to have a conversation? Do you know what I mean? Get up in the morning. Yeah. Like, I'm great. Would you like to have a conversation? <laughs> Some, sometimes you need to buy into your own hype to actually get yeah. through a day. I've, I've had crushing moments where I'm just like, oh my goodness, I, I'm, in, I'm in the wrong life. What am I doing here? But then things will happen and actually be like, well, this is the right direction to go down. I'm, I'm, I'm actually good at this. And it's okay to say that. Um, and as o over time, as confidence builds, you, you, you call out what's good and you call out what's bad. And it's okay to do that. Yeah. And, and also, if you're in a position, um, and I don't know what you guys feel about this, but if you're in a position where you're working in, re in a relatively small company and you have no DNI program or initiative, this could be the perfect opportunity for you to have those conversations to say, why do we not have one? And obviously now you've explained why we don't have one. What do you need from me in terms of maybe... Um, I don't know, what do you need from me for me to be able to make this happen? What do we need to do to get this DNI in place? And then that is something, that is an experience that you've been through. That's something that you're setting up to help your colleagues. That's something that you know is going to be in place for absolutely ever, for as long as the company exists, to make sure that anybody new who comes in, um, you know, does feel represented. And also it puts diversity and inclusion at the top of the, the company's to-do list and at the top of their agenda as well. I mean, I don't know what you guys think. Absolutely. And I think there's, there's a really great opportunity here. There's a charter called the Race at Work Charter and thousands of British companies have signed up to it. Um, first starting point to, could be, has your company signed up to it? If not, why not? is there an intention to sign up to it really the, go online find it read it it's 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 very i won't say simple to, to follow but it's very it's very straightforward in what their objectives are and, and it's it's equality in the work racial, racial equality in the workplace it's simple as that and yeah. that's creating something is actually um actually pushing things forward, actually having them conversation actually puts a bit in process so that then when people, new people do join a company, they know what the actual company stands for. Because I think if someone's got a process in place, then it's a lot about the company. Yeah, like do, there's always questions that, um, I have lots of conversations with PAs and EAs about, you know, going through an interview process, you know, what should they be asking? What are the things that people should be asking? Oh, Sue's put, um, Hayley, what's the charter name again? Race at Work Charter. Race at Work Charter. Um, I'll make sure that I send that to everybody in our follow-up email. But, um, you know, I have lots of conversations with people as they're preparing for interviews, especially right now, because obviously we're going through a huge shift in our entire industry. And the, the most awkward question that people seem to have an issue with answering is when the potential employer says, have you got any questions for me? And I think we can all relate to the fact that we think, oh my God, 
maybe you've prepped something and you've forgotten it or they've answered all your questions that you potentially had already and you don't want to look as though you're disengaged and you know you just have to ask something so there are two things that I always say you should be asking one how do you support diversity and inclusion and two how do you support my learning and development and I think those two questions will tell you everything that you need to know about the company culture about the way that the board works about the way that people feel uh, or feel treated or the way that the the company treats their employees and I think those are two really key questions but obviously more so than ever now you know how do you support diversity and inclusion and not just do you have a bit of paper that says this is what our policy is how do you put that in place how do you actually promote that how do you get everybody within the company involved because I think a lot of places will see this as Hayley you I think you mentioned earlier it's you know a, a tick box they just need to get this done. A lot of businesses will think they just need to get this done and it won't be done in the right way. It will be rushed. Um, so I think it's everybody's responsibility to hold our employers accountable and not just our current employers, but our future employers. And there's the, the element of getting things done. This is, this is going to be work in progress. This is going to way outlive me. Um, and it's, in, it's having helping who's coming up behind us as well and it's our families our kids our nieces our nephews um who are all going to be in the job market that some might want to be EAs and PAs so kind of like what, what have we done for the generation that's coming up behind us yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay, so we've got one more question. Josh, we'll go to you first. Do you feel more empowered now because of the climate to address and counter microaggressions with your peers? I think, I think yes, personally, I think because I've got that confidence to be able to do that. Because before, I didn't really have that kind of confidence to be able to, whereas now I kind of can ever speak my truth and actually say what I think rather than shy away from it. Yeah, and Hayley, how do you feel? Well, I kind of, I've got nothing to lose. If being myself um, isn't good enough, I, I, I've got nothing to lose. I, I, need to, I need to be able to sleep at night. I need, I need to be able to do the right thing um, and ask the questions and be able to if my son one day asks me, but mummy, how did you react to this? Or, or mum, how did you react to a, a scenario or a situation? And I turn around and say, I did nothing. Um, I, that doesn't sit well with me. No. Um, I mean, well, I'm going to ask you both actually one more question, but um, it'd be really great to get input from everybody in the chat box. Is everybody clear about what a microaggression is? Does everybody identify with what a microaggression actually is? Um, and whilst we get a little bit of feedback from everybody on the call, um, it goes back to a point that was raised earlier about people not necessarily feeling 100% comfortable because they don't know what to say when it is when you know when you're trying to overcome um, racism at work. So for everybody on this call and for everybody on this call who has um, non-black friends if someone says something inappropriate at work and it's targeted to one of your colleagues who's a black colleague and that you can visibly see that they are uncomfortable and you can visibly see that they are struggling and maybe they don't have the confidence to say anything how do you tackle that what is the i know it might sound really obvious but what is the best way for somebody to you know say hang on a second this is, this is wrong. You can't say that. You've got to call it out right mm. there and then. Um, uh, you just got to do it and hope that you're in a place that supports you. If not, then you, you need to be able to speak to your manager. You need to be able to seek advice from your HR departments. Um, or if you have people you can talk to or other colleagues just yeah it's you it's got to be done in real time you kind of I, I feel sometimes you i felt in the past that sometimes the the window of validity has passed 
Um, and if I go back to it, I feel like I'm creating a scene. Um, that's why pulling it out in real time is a really good thing. Maybe you're not the type of person that feels comfortable doing that, but follow up, you must follow up. 100% I agree with that because if you let someone get away with it once they'll keep on doing it and it's not acceptable and it's not right it's no. not and th th let's be honest sometimes these are things people are very very unaware of and could be really shocked that that they actually you actually interpret this as a microaggression so it adds mm -hmm. to their learning journey as well and I, I like to think that if I was to ever highlight one people would be grateful that I've, I've done that and we can talk it out but yeah. what so add to that is um, when you are kind of calling it out, we shouldn't be made to feel bad for actually calling it out because actually, you know, if it was the other way around, it'd be a whole different story, which is why we have to call it out there and nip it in the bud so that then we can, you know, make sure it doesn't happen again. If it was a comment against a blat if it was a comment against a woman or an undertone comment against a female at work, it, w it just would not be accepted. Mm. So it should not be accepted on a racial basis either. No, and that I think is the, the strangest thing to me about why this topic is still so unbelievably relevant because people stand up for injustice every single day, yet this isn't something that still seems to be at the top of people's agendas, which needs to change. It needs to change and it starts with conversations like this. And I just want to say thank you so much to both of you for taking the time today to join us and have a really frank honest open conversation because as we said to begin with this was going to be emotional it was going to be raw and that's what it needs to be we we very very loosely had a conversation about what we wanted to cover um, and we just wanted to make sure it flowed didn't we and that it was just a very natural conversation so I just want to say thank you so so much all of you and thank you everybody who attended um, I'm going to be following up with you all um, tomorrow and again in about six weeks time to see how you've all you know taken what we've learned today put that into practice in your own lives put that into practice within your circles at work and and how you've addressed this with your own businesses if it's something that you know, you know needs to be spoken about if you fall within that 70%. You know, as Bev said earlier, we've got Black History Month in October. That's everybody's deadline to get this on the agenda for everyone. Um, so I'll be following up with you all. I'll include contact details to Hayley and Josh for their LinkedIn account. Don't worry guys, I won't give anyone's <laughs> email address. You'll be inundated, I'm sure. Um, but I'll make sure that you are all able to connect so that if you want to carry on the conversation, you can absolutely do so. Um, but thank you so much everybody for joining. Thank you guys for a fab session. Thank you. Thanks Jess. That's amazing. It'd be wonderful to see you all again. But yeah, look, have a lovely evening, everybody. I hope where you are, you're safe. I hope you're well. Um, I hope work's, you know, going absolutely brilliantly for you all. And for those of you who are currently out of work or furlough, all of our love to all of you. Um, remember, if there's anything you ever need, you can 100% um, drop me an email or give me a call or just write a note to me on, on LinkedIn. I'm totally here for you all. So yeah, thanks Hayley. Thank you, Josh. Thanks so Thank much you. Jess for having us. Yeah. It's been amazing. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.